my drink of choice today is um, a big old cup of coffee. <laughs> it's Joshua Tree Coffee Co. Um, I bought their coffee when I, when my husband and I went to uh, uh, Joshua Tree, <laughs> California back in October. And I just recently ground up these beans and uh, it is just delightful. Uh, just Joshua Tree Coffee Co. coffee, um, some oat milk and a little bit of sugar. That's all I need in a cup of coffee. I'm a simple woman, <laughs> nothing too crazy. Hello and welcome back to the Cozy Moth Knits YouTube channel. Um, though there is no knitting going on in this video, I am uh, taking this time to talk to you about the books that I read in April and to share with you my thoughts on them. Um, I did not read as many books in April as I did in March, uh, but I would say it was definitely quality over quantity this month compared to March. And I am posting this video halfway through May, um, but there is a reason why I'm doing that and that is because this video is sponsored. Do you want to say hello? <laughs> want to say hello? Hi everyone, before we get into the book review portion of the video, I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, the sponsor of today's video, and that sponsor is Ana Luisa. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Ana Luisa is a jewelry company based out of New York. Uh, they offer uh, unique jewelry pieces at an affordable price. Uh, they are carbon neutral and uh, sustainable for the planet. And if you click my link in the description of this video and use my code, the Cozy Moth Knits 10, you will get 10% off your first order of Ana Luisa. Um, I am a huge fan of Ana Luisa. I've been a fan uh, even before they reached out to me. I wear their pieces all the time. They are staples. They really just elevate my outfit, but I want to talk to you about what um, the pieces that I chose to show you guys. Um, while I am wearing some of my staples like this necklace and this ring, um, I do have three more pieces to show you in this video. Uh, so the first is uh, the Frida earrings. And they're just a sweet little uh, gold um, huggy style um, earring with just like a little pearl at the bottom of it. It's just super elegant, very, um, yeah, very dainty, dainty and neutral, but yet, um, like I said earlier, it just elevates an outfit, makes you feel a little bit more sophisticated and classic. Uh, next we have the Rigel ring. Rigel Regal, <laughs> and it is this one right here. It is a pretty little gold band. I'll take it off for you. Where it has a little celestial designs in there, some little stars. Super pretty, super dainty. Uh, can be casual and yet yet spruce up um, whatever outfit you're putting together. Um, I am a huge lover of rings. Um, I there's just something about a ring that makes me feel opulent and I just, um, they're one of my new favorite accessories. And the third piece of jewelry that I'm going to talk to you about today is the Malia bracelet or Malia. Let's see if you can see that up there. It's just, again, another super dainty and um, a lightweight bracelet that just, again, like it just makes you feel just, you know, a little bit more put together when you put on these pieces. And I love this one. This is actually my first bracelet from Anna Luisa and I am obsessed with it. I know this is going to be one that's again, going to be another one of my staples. Um, yeah, I just love their products so much. And that's not just me, you know, saying all this because they're sponsoring. I genuinely love their products and I tell everyone. <laughs> I'm like, oh, do you like my necklace? It's Anna Luisa, my ring. Anna Luisa. If you're interested in any of these pieces or want to check out Anna Luisa for yourself and see what they have to offer you, uh, use the link in the description down below and you, you can use code the Cozy Moth Knits 10 for 10% off your order. Uh, a lot of the jewelry pieces start at $39, which is incredibly um, you know, budget friendly. They were thinking about us girls who, you know, <laughs> live paycheck to paycheck. Um, so again, click the link down below. Use code the Cozy Moth Knits 10 for 10% off your order. And, you know, tell me what you think about Anna Luisa's um, jewelry selection. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna end this here and we will get back to the 
regular schedule video. All right, so that we got that out of the way, I am going to take some time to talk to you about all that I read this month. But yeah, they're all pretty great and I'm excited to talk to you about them. So let's just get started. So let's get into the first book that I read this month. And it was a quick one, though <laughs> Though there was a lot in it, and that is Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. You can't tell already based on my other uh, what I read this month videos, uh, Greek mythology retellings have a chokehold on me and uh, it is not letting go anytime soon. Uh, so I think instead of just, you know, going through and reading as many as possible. I'm trying to dedicate, you know, I'm trying to read one Greek mythology retelling a month. And this was my uh, Greek mythology retelling for the month of April. So despite this book being pretty short, it was only uh, like 300 pages. Um, a lot happens in this one. And uh, because so much happens, I tried to like write down a succinct, um, <laughs> summary so I'm just gonna look to the side and uh, just read off what I wrote. I would say um, spoilers but this story is thousands of years old uh, so if you don't know it then that's on you guys like I don't know what to tell you. Ariadne follows the life of, the, of its titular protagonist Ariadne princess of Crete. Ariadne is the daughter of Minos the king of Crete uh, the granddaughter of Helios, the sun god, and is the sister of the Minotaur, or a stepsister of the Minotaur if you want to say that. Uh, after helping Theseus slay the Minotaur in order to free the Athenians from imprisonment, Theseus promises to marry Ariadne but then leaves her on an island to die. However, the island belongs to the Olympian god Dionysus, who allows her to stay on the island and uh, keep it uh, you know, keep it flourishing uh, before he ultimately marries her himself. Ariadne's sister, Phaedra, ends up marrying Theseus after he tells her that her sister died and then she herself becomes the queen of Athens. After many years, the sisters dramatically reunite after Theseus is caught in a lie about Ariadne's death. Phaedra admits to Ariadne that she is unhappy in her marriage to Theseus and is in fact falling in love for Theseus. Theseus's um, biological son and, uh, and her stepson and she intends to make her feelings known to him <sighs> she should like good lord um, er anyway uh, Ariadne tries to top her sister but it is too late Ariadne leaves Athens following the death of her sister uh, Ariadne also learns of a horrendous cult that is dedicated to her husband that engages in animal and human sacrifice. Uh, Dionysus's hubris grows over the admiration of his followers and his pride leads to a great tragedy at his brother's home. Trying to save her husband from the wrath of Hera, the wife of Zeus, Ariadne is turned to stone out of revenge. And holy moly, <laughs> again, all that happens in just 300 pages. It goes by so fast. So I think I think it's awesome that Jennifer State took so much time to dedicate to Ariadne because as it's pretty, uh, I mean, like you don't have to be a fan of Greek mythology to like, no, this is true, but a lot of the women in these Greek mythology stories are barely mentioned or don't really play a large role in the great epics. Um, so having these retellings dedicated to these women um, is pretty great, you know, to get like the women's side of the story of things and, you know, just to get dedicate more time to these really strong and beautiful characters like Circe, like Ariadne. While I did really like the story, I do have a few gripes about it. <laughs> like a lot of the writing in here is unfortunately pretty repetitive. Like Ariadne like will go and spend time with her sister and we see everything that happens with her sister. And then she goes back to the island and then tells Dionysus every little thing that we literally just read. <laughs> it's like, why are we hearing the same story twice? Um, just for Dionysus to go, hmm, interesting, mortals are hard to understand. It's like, <laughs> like, oh, you and your mortal concerns, like, you know, us gods don't have to be so concerned with such things. It's like, okay, like, that was a waste of time, honestly. In, like, in addition to things being told twice or sometimes three times, a lot of things are told via word of mouth. Like, especially with Dionysus's. Especially with Dionysus. 
especially Dionysus, I'll just leave it at that, and his life. Um, a lot of it's just told through stories that he tells Ariadne, which I guess is reflective of the time, but like, I don't know, it's kind of kind of interesting, but it's not just like that, but like anything Dionysus does and sometimes things that Ariadne does is just, it's just viewed from a lens of her telling Dionysus or her telling Phaedra what happened. I don't know, like I'd like, I'd rather see it, <laughs> see it, uh, than read it or hear about it, you know. Also, <laughs> the speaking of Dionysus, the blurb in this book does not mention Dionysus at all, and he's a pretty pivotal character in the life of Ariadne, you know, her husband. <laughs> um, the book, like the blurb, like spends more time talking about the Minotaur and Theseus than like anything else that happens after it. Where Act where everything that happens with the Minotaur and Theseus happens in less than the first happens in less than a hundred pages like I think it's like up to like page like 75 or something like that is when like the whole thing with the Minotaur is over and at that point like that's like less than a third of the book so it seems and sometimes like this book feels a little rushed you also like don't like read a whole lot about Daedalus and um, Icarus. Again, pretty pivotal characters in this story. And yeah, like there's like, I think you talk to Daedalus maybe once, never hear anything from Icarus. All you hear about is how, you know, Icarus flew too close to the sun and now Daedalus is missing and everyone's looking for him. Like that's basically all that happens with him. And it's kind of sad because I liked Daedalus as a character in Circe, even though like I'm going off of a book that someone else wrote. <laughs> but um, but I really like Daedalus as a character. And I also like Dionysus as a character pretty much. I like Dionysus' relationship with Ariadne in this book. Um, I think it's sweet. I think, it, you know, as sweet as a relationship with a mortal and a god can be. Um, but I really liked his character. I would have liked more of Dionysus in here, but um, not a whole lot in this one. But those are my only gripes, um, which like aren't too, too bad. They're just like personal preferences really. But I still like really, really like this book um, and I highly recommend it. I would say to perhaps read anything by Madeline Miller first, whether that be Circe or Song of Achilles. I think her books are a great start to Greek mythology retellings because of the way she writes. They're so descriptive and she puts so much into it. Where this again felt really rushed, but I feel like this was good for me to read after reading Madeline Miller. The quote that I chose is uh, probably around the middle of the book and Ariadne is talking a little bit about Dionysus. I had been a fool to trust in a hero, a man who could only love the mighty echo of his own name throughout the centuries. It could have undone me. I could have shriveled and died on this very beach. I could have wept a lonely ocean before the crows came from my eyes, and my blinded spirit could have howled for an eternity in the bleak marshes at the banks of the Styx. But instead, this laughing god had cast his light across my story. I give Ariadne four stars. All right, after reading so much fiction in March, I think I only read one nonfiction book in March. Um, I was ready for some edutainment, if you will. Um, I am a sucker for most things true crime and by asso association, uh, cults, <laughs> anything related to a cult, like is just very interesting to me, very intriguing. Uh, so I had seen this book uh, show up in bookstores and uh, recommended to me um, on social media. And there was just something about this one that like really drew my eye to it. Even though like I never read the blurb, I just like picked it up and was like, okay, you're coming home with me. Uh, so this is Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism by Amanda Montel. While this isn't specifically about like cults as like an entity it's more about the language used by cults and cult leaders not even so much cults but like other um other entities that uh, draw people in and how they use language to again draw people in and make them feel like they're part of a community and 
make them abandon anything that isn't this, you know, warm and welcoming, you know, you are welcome here kind of situation that they've fallen into. Um, so it, it was incredibly fascinating to read. Um, some things that I didn't even consider. There was a lot of like, hmm, moments in here like, oh, that makes so much sense. Um, but I really, really like this one. So I'm just going to read the blurb that's in here because I feel like it sums it up pretty well. What makes cults so intriguing and frightening? What makes them powerful? The reason why so many of us binge Manson documentaries by the dozen and fall down rabbit holes researching suburban moms gone QAnon is that what we're looking is that what we're looking for in a satisfying explanation for what causes people to join and more important stay in extreme groups. We secretly want to know could this ha could this happen to me? Amanda Montel's argument is that on a level, it already has. Our culture tends to provide pretty flimsy answers to questions of cult influence, mostly just vague talk of brainwashing. It has nothing to do with the mind control wizardry or Kool-Aid. In Cultish, Montel argues that the key to manufacturing intense ideology, community, us versus them attitude all comes down to language. In both positive and shadowy ways, cultish language is something we hear and, and are influenced by every single day. Through juicy storytellings and cutting edge original research, Montel exposes the linguistic elements that make a wide spectrum of communities cultish, revealing not only how cult language affects uh, followers of groups as notorious as Heaven's Gate, but also pervades the modern startups, fitness brands, and Instagram feeds. Incisive and darkly funny, this capturing take on a curious social science of power and belief will make you want to hear the fanatical language of cultis, cultish everywhere. So, wow, like how can you not be sucked into this? I mean, that cultis, cultish language is right there, you know, making you want to draw in and read about this and know more about the language used around you to get you to interact with something. But yeah, like I was just enthralled by this one. It was so incredibly interesting. I could not put it down. It was just, again, like it, it really opens your eyes to the importance of language in our everyday life. So <laughs> highly recommend this one if you're a fan of not, again, not just uh, true crime and cults, but just like society in general. It's a pretty quick read. It's short. It's small, it's easy to put in your purse, so you can pull it out. Like the cover is pretty cool looking. Like look at that cover. Like that's probably one of my favorite covers in, in, out of all the books that I've read this year so far. <laughs> uh, but I will end this little review with a quote. In an attempt to find a less judgy way to discuss non-mainstream spiritual communities, many scholars have used the neutral sounding labels such as new religious movements, emergent religions, and marginalized religions. But while these phases work in, the con in academic contexts, they don't really capture the CrossFits, multi-level marketing companies, college theater programs, and any other hard to categorize points along the influence continuum. We need a more versatile way to talk about these communities that are cult-like in one way or another, but not necessarily connected to the supernatural, which is why I like the word cultish. I give cultish four stars. All right, the next book that I read um, in April, and it took up actually the majority of my time in April reading this one, and you'll see why. And it is The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. And look at that chonky boy. It is quite a thick one. Um, let's see how much it is, uh, 550 pages. Um, <laughs> definitely uh, a lot bigger than the last two that I've read. <laughs> So this book is both a page turner and gut wrenching and um, in all the good ways. I, never once did I feel like I was ready for this book to end. Um, I was very much engrossed in it. Um, so, but let me tell you about it. Let me give you a little bit of a summary. Again, I'm just gonna read from my summary that I wrote down here just to keep my thoughts succinct. Um, the Book of Form and Happiness follows 14-year-old Benny O and his mother Annabelle following the, tra the tragic and sudden death of Benny's father. During his father's funeral, Benny begins to hear the voices of items around him. Um, 
At the same time, Annabelle begins to hoard as a trauma response to the loss of her husband. That only amplifies the voices that Benny is inundated by. This results in many outbursts and being admitted to PDSI or pediatric psychology psych unit on multiple occasions. The only place Benny finds solace is at the local public library. And he makes friends with local ruffians um, who also find comfort within the four walls of the library. As time goes on, Benny uh, continues to skip school and he is met with some very real consequences that affect not just him, but his mother, who is just trying to do her best to understand her teenage son. Uh, the story is a roller coaster of emotions, and the ending is very, si very satisfying, but not without tears. <laughs> Holy Hannah, <laughs> this was a great book. Needless to say, I was not expecting to love this story as much as I did. The story focuses both on Benny and his mother uh, going back and forth um, in between chapters. It is actually told from the perspective of the book itself. The book is telling the story. Um, Benny interacts with the book and interjection, interjecting his thoughts on both his story and his mother's story as the book goes on. It's a very interesting way to um, write that, uh, that narrative. Um, as much as I found Benny's story to be emotional and moving with, you know, losing his father, uh, hearing, dealing with the voices in his head, um, getting um, admitted to pe the pediatric psych ward, uh, being diagnosed with schizophrenia, and his unrequited, unrequited love with an older woman. <laughs> why do I always try, to, why do I always end up finding the most controversial <laughs> books? Uh, unrequited love with an older woman, which, you know, um, um, but like, yeah, like despite his story being moving and sad, I was actually drawn more to his mother Annabelle's story, um, especially after we learned about her relationship with her late husband and how she has literally no support system where she lives. This is um, anywhere city USA or anywhere city North America, I should say. Um, she has no support system. Um, she, her job is falling apart, you know, um, that's not, that's not a problem of her own. It's just that it's moving forward and they don't want to train her <laughs> and they keep trying to get rid of her, but this is all she knows. She wanted to go to school to become a librarian, but that fell apart after she became pregnant with Benny and, um, and then having to deal with, you know, she's trying to, you know, work on her hoarding issue like she's reading basically this book's version of the life tidying the life changing magic of tidying up you know the Marie Kondo book uh, she's like reading that and doing her best with that but also trying to work and take care of her son and then CPS is at her door and her son keeps running away and she's just trying her best and her husband's not there for her and like you just like feel so bad for this woman you just want to like take her and hug her and tell her everything's gonna be okay and like there were many times where i cried over this woman i just you know wanted to be there for her be her friend um but um it's just so sweet i especially love the story about, about how annabelle and benny's father met and it's just so sweet. <laughs> I just, you know, so oh, how sweet. And yeah, but uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, I feel like this story does a really great job at depicting mental illness, and, but also it depicts uh, grief in a very interesting way and how the two um, intersect together and how different people respond to those emotions differently. And um, yeah, I just thought it was fantastic. She hadn't meant to start collecting snow globes too, but the little turtles that she had bought from the first shop had cheered, on, cheered her on so tremendously. It sat at the base of the main control center monitor, and whenever she started feeling overwhelmed by bad news, she would pick up the snow globe, turn it upside down, and watch the iridescent sparkles swirl and settle. There was no news inside the globe. Nothing ever changed. There was a world there, the world stayed exactly as it was and she found this reassuring. Of course, it was sad that the baby turtle was trapped, sealed off, and swimming alone in his orb, and sad too that the mother turtle was watching from the outside, that the mother turtle watching from the outside was unable to reach him. Still, they could see each other through the glass, and somehow from this thought came another, 
and perhaps the two turtles would like to be friends. I give the book of form and emptiness 4.5 stars. All right, the final book that I read in April was Lester by Raven Lilani. And holy heck, <laughs> I literally read this book in one day. I mean, it's a short little guy. Um, how many pages? Yeah, like, yeah, like 250. So, but this was a book I simply could not put down. I don't know. Well, I know what it was about it. I know why I couldn't put it down, but, um, yeah like this was a book that i had seen mixed reviews on that some people like some people didn't but i wanted to know for myself and i really really enjoy this one i only put it down once uh for a lunch break uh to you know sustain myself after reading this book um but i was absolutely transfixed by this one so lester follows edie a young 20 something black woman who has found herself intertwined in, rela in a relationship with a married man who makes it very clear by the way by the way that he is married and is in an open relationship but he does have a set of rules that he has to follow in order to be in a, be in an open relationship as the story progresses uh edie finds herself actually living in her boyfriend's home the married man <laughs> uh boyfriend is big quotations or i don't think there was a label actually put on it um she actually finds herself living in his home along with his wife and their adopted daughter who is also black and she she finds she ends up kind of being a um, not so much a role model for this young uh black preteen girl but just you know someone who she can you know just like just like someone like her that she can go to for comfort and after saying that um this story is uh tense sexy frustrating and a train wreck you just can't look away from um and i mean that in the most respectful way possible i mean there's so much happening in this little book um how could you not put it down i found, my, I found myself rooting for edie uh the entire story and you know cheering her on along the way but also at the same time i was just like girl girl like really like what are you doing <laughs> as much as i want you to see you succeed and i want you to be happy what are you doing <laughs> you know like like because this book is so small i can't really spend a whole lot of time talking about what exactly happens you kind of just have to read it yourself but this book honestly reads like an hbo max like limited series um like it's so quick something's always happening there's never a dull moment um yeah it just reads so quickly so interestingly it's just fantastic it's a fantastic read i highly highly recommend it um it is a little spicy it's pretty spicy i should say <laughs> probably just a little bit more spicy than anything sally rooney has written um but that's just my perspective um i really liked it honestly um but anyway uh i'm just gonna leave you with a short little quote i'm good but not good enough which is worse than simply being bad I give Lester 4.25 stars. All right, so this is everything that I read in April and I am super happy with everything. Everything was within the four star range. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean like a lot of the books that I've read have been in like the four star range and I haven't, um, and I, I, I'm pretty happy about it. These are all super fantastic books. Highly, highly recommend them to anyone who likes to read. I think there's a little bit of something for everyone in this little, this little pile right here. And um, yeah, I hope that you enjoy them <laughs> um, if you decide to read them. If you do decide to read them or if you have read any of these, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from you and talk to you about them. Um, yeah, I'm just this is i'm just so happy with this little stack well with all that being said <laughs> thank you very much for tuning into this video um i've really been enjoying these um these like book reviews that i've been doing every month um i hope you guys like them too um, um my hope is to get back into knitting more than one thing uh hopefully come the summer um i'm kind of uh, i kind of talked about in a 
Instagram story that I posted uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, just how I'm just gonna start uploading knitting content when I feel good about it. <laughs> um, I've been really working on the on one project for the past two months and been very monogamous on it and I haven't really had anything more to say about it. Um, my knitting mojo has been pretty low in general. Um, I've just been going through a whole lot of changes over the past uh since the beginning of the year realistically from like on different levels different things coming at me um and because of all of that i'm still trying to adjust to those changes and it has affected my knitting mojo if i'm being honest uh, i still knit though it is slow and um again only working on one project right now but my hope is that once that one project is finished i can um, start working on more things. There are a lot of things I want to work on. I want to get back to knitting socks. <laughs> I want to get back to knitting uh, garments. But right now I'm just trying to finish this one project by the end of the month, which I probably won't finish by the end of the month, but at least hopefully the beginning of June. Um, so that's if I'm, when I'm not reading, <laughs> I'm knitting. Um, so but I, I still like making content for you guys and um, I have been reading a lot more due to the nature of just where I am in life right now. I have more time to read as opposed to knit. Hopefully knitting content will be back soon. I just don't have anything to share with you right now um, and I don't want to just like force something when I don't feel confident enough to do it, you know? And uh, I want to just do this because I like it, not because I'm forced to stick to a schedule. Um, so anyway, that's my little my little life update at the end uh, but again thank you so much for watching this and um, I'm looking forward to uh, the next uh, you know video that I put out for you guys soon and uh, thank you again so much to Anna Luisa for sponsoring this video um, this is you know something that I've been you know not to be dramatic I've been manifesting <laughs> this um, uh, collaboration, um, the sponsorship, and now it's finally here and I'm really happy to do it. And um, you know, uh, do check out the link in the description below and I hope that you guys fall for Ana Luisa as much as I did. Um, and I think I'm going to end this video here. So um, with all that being said, stay safe everyone. Uh, keep knitting, reading, you know, do what makes you happy. And uh, I will see you all later. Mm -hmm.